Hey, Dan, I just realized I'm not going to be home Sunday. So can you please go to walk work and order the Jared with the crispies on the side? And then you can go to the studio and put it in the refrigerator so that when I'm there on Monday, I can have my lunch because they're not open on Monday walk works. But I like to eat it seven days a week, even though they're only open six. Okay, bye. Steven, so I woke up Sunday morning, like not like the morning when my alarm went off, but like in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, <laughs> I was waiting for it. <laughs> um, I-, I woke up and I was like, oh, sh- oh shit, I- I'm staying here till Monday. And-, and-, and when I get home Monday, Walkworks is going to be closed and I won't be able to get to Jared. <laughs> so, so you, you had like a nightmare that woke you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did that. I wanted to have lunch uh, on Monday because what would I eat on Monday when I get home? Because I was supposed to originally be home Sunday. Well, what were you going to do if you didn't do that, man? Dude, I How don't know what I would How would you survive Monday? I don't know. <laughs> I needed, I would need to get good food. And so, <laughs> so I, I, um, I texted Dan in the morning and I'm like, dear Dan, are you around today in Fishtown? To which he was like, yes. And so I was like, all right, I need you. I'm going to order the Jared. Actually, no, I modified the Jared because I can't get the crunchy wontons, crispy wontons, because oh, if, they no. have to stay in the, if they stay in the refrigerator, they're going to be mushy the next day. So I'm like, Dan, I'm going to order my lunch when you tell me that you can go get it. And then you're going to ask them for a side of crunchies for Jared. They know that. <laughs> and then you're going to take it to work and you're going to put it in the fridge so it's here for me when I get back on Monday. Such a riveting conversation. <laughs> and that's what happened. Steven, do you know how important my lunch is? Let me just say this, Everything Steven, revolves around food with you, which let is me fine. Just, let me say why. When I was shooting in Indianapolis with the crew, every day the question comes up is, what do you want to have for lunch today? If I had my druthers, I would send the PA kid over to Whole Foods every day. And I'd be like, go to the cold counter, get me a salmon filet, cooked salmon filet cold i'll eat it cold <clears throat> with and and the, and the grilled one not the one with the seasoning or any of that bullshit Definitely on not top that that one. Adds, nope nope no fun nope i want <laughs> the salmon and the two sides i want string beans and i want mashed potatoes and get me a mini baguette and i would eat that every day for lunch and do not mess up you mess up that order it's bad news but no we have to think about lunch every day which takes brain power and you have to worry about what everybody wants <laughs> so much brain it's power bullshit. no it takes brain power and instead of just eating we're like oh l- let's do sushi for dinner tonight it's just like no i'm sending you to whole Foods. so the last day they get some shitty meal for some lunch and i just was like i'm not getting that i told the kid what i wanted at at whole foods he went to whole foods and when the food got there and i'm eating my beautiful salmon filet with my string beans and my mashed potatoes and my mini baguette they're eating these gross looking shitty tacos that they definitely <laughs> complained about and i said now you want to give me shit for ordering this yeah so Take Trying that. to warn you. The best, though, is going on press trips with you. And you're always like the first one in when we go to a restaurant or break for lunch or something like that. And you have to always walk around, look at everything that's out for lunch. And then you look at me and it's either a good look or a bad <laughs> look. And I can tell instantly if you're super pissed off and you want to go somewhere else or you're, you're happy with what they have. <laughs> first one in the room <laughs> usually they're pre-warned about my eating needs at sony and canon and nikon trips well that- and you will show your disgust too if you're pissed off you're like oh, oh, oh. <laughs> we're gonna eat this shit look if they're gonna do cold cuts and garbage i'm gonna fucking complain because you have us held hostage I, for I these agree. press trips and if you're not going to feed us properly i'm not going to function well and i'm not going to be fucking happy uh, especially in the morning there's been many press trips where it's like a, a grab and go like something donuts a donut pastries yeah. and you're not eating till like two o'clock later that day and meanwhile we're going to go out and shoot all morning so that's a little tough to kind of fuel yourself and that's when it's annoying all I need in the morning is I bring my own protein. Just give me a fucking little bowl of oats, just raw. One time they gave me like oats and it was, they, 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 it came out with like berries, sugar, syrup, and nuts all over it. <laughs> and remember. I'm like, no, you, and I gave it to Ted Forbes. I'm like, this is not, just give me raw fucking oats. Just scoop a bunch of that paste shit is whatever that's like glue in here and i'm gonna eat it because that's my carb for for the morning and and that's it it's crazy how far your food journey has come back in the day you were just putting ketchup on everything and eating like the worst things ever and drinking high c and what was it kool-aid too 
No, never drank Kool Aid. It was always Hawaiian punch. Hawaiian punch. That's it. Yeah. And apple juice and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whatever, Stephen. We're so here's what we're gonna do today. We are gonna talk about uh, USPS. We're gonna talk about me throwing out a bag of M and M's. We're gonna complain all episode. <laughs> Yeah, what else is new? I (laughs) I met John Green. We're going to go into the Apple Vision Pro, which I have and I'm not wearing currently, but I did. I actually didn't wear it yesterday because I was busy doing other stuff. I'm actually surprised you're not wearing it right now. I don't want to wear it right now. I wonder what it would be like. Can you do Zoom in there? Well, I could. (laughs) You're thinking about it. (laughs) No, I I, I don't know if there's a Zoom. Yeah, I think so. There's got to be a Zoom app. There's iPad a Zoom app. iPad app, yeah. so I'll have to try that later. Interesting. But what would I look like? A douchebag? So <laughs> we're not going to get to you guys laughing at me uh, in my... Uh, well, no one would see it except me. I would laugh. <laughs> you guys were laughing the other day. Anyway, we're going to talk about me ed- having to edit something, how I was watching my footage back, a factory update, and of course, let's talk about blurry photos for wedding photography being yes. like a major trend that's here to stay. So cool. <laughs> Cause they, cause they suck. But, but also cooking with Jared finally posted the cooking with Jared yes. video. The Deb shot it and she edited it and it made it. And, and I really like the video. I think it's going to be good. I knew you would. You've been wanting to do that video for fuck man. I don't know. 10 years, but it's a good cooking video. I like it. And one of my friend, Michael Salamana from Zahav, he's like, when did you start a cooking show? I'm like, no, that's not a cooking show. That's just a one-off video. (laughs) But see, that's the thing. I saw a comment someone left and there was like, this is a warning to, or or this is, this is what all food YouTubers should watch to see how a video should be produced and shot and edited and, and like sizzle roll and sizzle rolls, B roll and all that stuff. Because it's cinematic. It's not just some shittily shot thing, which people are perfectly fine with. Well, I actually. think the issue is most people are trying to film themselves and they don't have like, you know, a person actually filming for them. But yeah, it looked good. Yeah, I liked it. So after I got back from one of those trips the other week and I was like, I need some ND filters or variable ND filters. And I knew that Peter McKinnon's Polar Pro filters had the uh, the magnets on them. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the pain in the ass things is when you take it off or to putting it on and taking it off. It's like, it's like, do I put it in my pocket? Where do I put it while I'm trying to, you know, adjust for exposure inside a dark environment? Yes, exactly. And I asked Polar Pro to send us out a couple of 82 millimeter filters. They're like 300 bucks a pop, by the way. So they They're did. They're not cheap, yeah. Turns out they shipped at USPS. <laughs> Excuse me, USPS, which is a joke. And so they sent it to US, USPS. And our, our guy that I work with who, who makes the connection is like, hey, it says delivered. Did you get it? It said delivered at 317. I'm like, uh, no, no, we didn't get it. I'm and looking at the door. We're there. Ch- yeah, we were here and I was checking the footage. Nothing on the ring doorbell, nothing on the security cameras. And so two days go by and I'm and I'm like, I get this idea. I'm like, do you think maybe they threw it over the fence? Hmm. And I get here yesterday morning and I look and there's a box there. There's a box laying on the other side of the fence. And so I go out and I get it. And yet it's Polar Pro. And let me tell you guys, our fence Glass is... Glass filters. And that fence has to be at least 10 feet tall. Seven feet tall? No, I think more than that. The gate you're talking about. The gate is like eight feet tall. Okay. Okay. Are you? I'm going to go fucking measure it. Why don't you wait right here? Okay. I'm going to go measure the fence, Stephen. Okay. I'll be right back. Important information. Do we have a tape measurer here? I think it's behind you, isn't it? Or it might be upstairs, actually. Hold on. It's probably upstairs. Don't worry about it. I'm going to go do it. Oh, my God. I couldn't find the tape measure and we will measure this and fill you in the next time <laughs> Steven is in or when I find it, I will post it on Instagram. How tall the fence is. It's probably seven and a half feet at most. Well, because you have a six foot privacy fence, a standard fence, and then the gate is definitely significantly taller than that. What are you going to you going to take the over eight? I'll take the under eight. You take I over mean, eight, eight sounds about right. I know it's more than six oh. for sure. Oh, it's not, it's not 10 feet tall. It's 47 feet tall. All right. <laughs> All right, now that we're done talking about a gate, oh they God. threw the, the USPS. We're, we're no longer going to yell at their FedEx drivers. Yeah, we will. Fucking douches. USPS, the, you're on the list. <laughs> USPS, you're, you're on the shit list <laughs> for throwing a box of filters over a fence onto pavers. Over a 54-foot fence. You <laughs> dumbasses. Way bigger than my six-inch fence for the ants. Anyway, screw them. They suck. Do not ship USPS. Like, how do you not ring a doorbell? Nothing was broken, right? No, wow. thankfully. But one of the boxes was dented. One of the filters uh, bo- that the filters came in was dented, but thankfully it is not broken. Can you actually see him throw it over the fence? 
I don't know if they did. Th- I can't. I can't find it on the thing because their timing isn't like isn't like um, uh, USPS the where, where they like scan it and then throw it over the fence or throw it on your doorstep. Oh. These guys probably scan it at a box somewhere and then come at any time, mm. and you never know. But I didn't see it. it. You know what would be a good option on the ring doorbell if it do like truck. If it could do truck or a delivery and not just, you know, if it knew what a USPS or a FedEx person looked like. Yeah, like it, it, it could scan, you know, a brown truck for UPS, a white truck. Yeah, but then I don't know. It would definitely get confused. Yeah, but it would be it would at least be close. Yeah. Actually, my nest, I can program faces in and I've programmed like mail lady. I've programmed UPS guy. Can you have a mail lady? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Mail Male lady. Oh, M A I L. Got it. Not a male lady. That's what they call lady boys in in Bangkok. Oh my god! Every week, how does this get brought up? <laughs> I just I'm trying to get but canceled. That's what's nice about the Nest, the Google products, is they actually tell you like UPS guy is here. Blah blah blah. I, does Ring not do that, I- Stephen? I don't go to extremes on my Ring. I don't give a shit. Okay. I I I don't have notifications on other than doorbell ringing because we've got eighty thousand cars that go by every day, every minute. I don't need to have the chime going off every three seconds. I like watching them walk over my grass. It's great. You're such a <clears throat> glass snob. Grass snob. <laughs> I am. Use the freaking driveway. It's open. There's no cars there. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, I'm not passionate about this at all. Yeah, so I threw M&Ms out. You make it seem like I'm crazy for talking about grass, yet we're talking about throwing M&Ms out now. (laughs) Yeah. Do you know where I threw them? Uh, In the trash? No. No, down the garbage disposer. Then ran water, then ran the garbage disposer. Because that way, I can't go into the trash to get them when I realize that they're there at the end of the day when I really want them. I always want them. It was a gift for my birthday, these M&Ms. I ate like half the bag. That's the problem. If it's in the house and I can get it, I'm going to want it. Mm. So the way that I stop eating shit and garbage is I don't have it in the house. That if I want to eat M&M's, I go get a single serving bag and I eat that and that's it. I don't have like a bag that has like eight servings or or so or 10 servings in it because I don't want to have it in the house. I used to do that with goldfish. I would prepackage. It's like 55 grams of goldfish was like the serving size. And I would have that with lunch instead of the giant box of goldfish where I can just eat it all day. And you eat goldfish. Uh, this is years back, but when I did, yes. You're talking about eating M&Ms. <laughs> yeah, but they're not goldfish. Okay. Jesus. So um, I've been traveling, as you know, to, to all over for the bowling show. And this time around, I was in Indianapolis filming, and I used the R3 and um, was doing a ton of slow motion. And on the last day, I had two R3s ready to go because I knew that shooting... 20, 30 minutes in a row or uh, on and off of 4K 120 was going to overheat it. And they did end up overheating. So I would switch back and forth between one camera and the next. But this is that's not like a knock on the camera. That's just not what it's designed for. 4K 120, most cameras will overheat shooting that kind of stuff, especially when you're shooting for like hours at a time. Yeah. So I was prepared and I was able to switch back and forth between two different cameras with the PA giving me one and giving me the other so that I was ready to go. But you asked me a question uh, about how is it watching back my footage, you know, when I get to see it on the computer and when you put a LUT on it because I was shooting in log versus what I thought. Now, I will say that when I look at the footage in camera or when I'm shooting it, you don't really know what you're getting. And then when you look back at it on your camera, you're like looking at it all flat because it's log and it's like, all right, I got that shot. But when you watch it back on the computer or before that, when when I'm sitting, I'm like, I don't know. I'm not really built for shooting B-roll. I'm not really built for shooting video. And then I watch the stuff back on the computer. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. (laughs) <laughs> I'm really good. I do belong here. I am this good at doing this stuff. I am the best filmmaker ever. I am the Donald Trump of photography. And what? Yeah, quite possibly one of the a top five Kubrick and uh, Scorsese. You're and not going to say these... number one. Wow. Who's who's number one? I'm I number three. You were going to say yourself? No, nah, I'm up there, Stephen. I'm like tremendous at shooting. Best of the best. Yeah, but. What, what did they ask me to do? Why don't you tell me what they asked me to do? So they want you to basically cull through all of your footage and cull it down to the best of the best shots that are worth 
putting into this docu series, and I think they no, asked for the sizzle reel. This is for the sizzle reel. Okay, for the sizzle reel. They asked you specifically because you know exactly what the story is, what was happening, what important shots are there. I'm just kind of surprised that they're not letting the editor go through all of the footage. If I was the editor, I personally would want to see every single clip shot because I don't know what I'm going to use until I know what the story is. The reason is simple. There's a budget for editing days, and they don't want to chew up five days of editing. No, I get that. Having them go through the footage. Chewing up your time. That's because we're trying to save the time for the editor and the budget that's there. And I'm editing down some of my stuff. I'm not going to do it all because you know what happened yesterday. Stephen got me all set up. (laughs) Stephen gets me set up in in Premiere and I don't I'm not an editor. So he's telling me, you know, you hit C for cut and V for the other thing and JKL, which I stopped using altogether and the plus and minus. And, you know, I'm going through and I'm starting at the beginning and I'm fucking done as soon as I start. Like within 20 minutes, I'm like, no, this is bullshit. I'm not doing this. Let me paint the picture too. Jared has about 20 hours of footage, give or take, of this one event in Indianapolis. Tell them that most of it is is slow-mo. Now, keep in mind, most of it is slow motion. And with Canon, it bakes it down to a 30p playback file. So, you know, it might really only be a 30 second clip that he recorded, but expanded out in 30p it's going to be like a two minute clip so in reality it might be more like 10 hours of footage maybe even less but just know it's a lot of footage that he's going through and i knew immediately when i had to give this to you i'm like there's no way you're going to make it past like an hour because i know how you are (laughs) yeah but so then i i fucking got all tense and got all upset and and it was really upsetting me and and creating tension and i i told my people look i i'm doing they want me to do mine and they want the other shooter to do his because he knows where everything is and I know where all my stuff is and and I get it. Like, I know what's good. The problem is getting to what's good and then chopping around it was just a fucking pain in the ass. I like, and I started at the very beginning of the, of the shoot and that's where I was shooting like regular speed stuff or, and also slow-mo and it's just guys practicing. I'm like, this is fucking tedious or a guy on the bowling truck walking around telling me what he's doing and that's seven minutes but you want me to cut around the middle parts but what if they need this and it's part of the story exactly that's the issue is you don't really know what the story is yet in this sizzle reel you don't know if you're going to need that intro shot or something in the middle of like just people walking or just random b-roll it's i'm just surprised they're making you kind of cut all that out yourself well i told them i told them that they have like an assistant editor type person yeah. that they that they use. I'm like, he's going to be doing, or they are going to be doing most of this. Because they should be I'm communicating with the lead editor and right. going back and forth and kind of getting a, a, you know, a good feel for what it's going to be. So after I flipped out on myself here <laughs> and walked around and got pissed off <laughs> and fucking told everybody I wasn't doing this shit, I sat down and I'm like, I'm going to start at the end. Because that's where the good stuff is. And so I started at the end and I've worked my way back. I'm through two and a half or three matches now. So I'm almost fully through the mat, the, the main stuff of good stuff that's on the lanes. And they're going to have to go through and find the other stuff. They're just going to have to do it because I, I, I'm i not going to sit there for 10 hours and, and, and do this. There's, there's those assistant editors. This is their job. They can go through. They can pick out what needs to be used from that. And I'm just not built for this. That's not, that's not my job. I'm not, I'm not built for this. I have a lot of custom shortcut keys that I can really speed through, culling through footage and stuff like that. But yeah, for the first time using Premiere and just doing it yourself, it, it's going to take you a lot of extra time than a standard editor to go through everything. Uh, that was the other issue with me. And when I would like remote into your computer to try and help you out with certain things, I have all my custom keyboard shortcuts that you don't have because you have the default Premiere shortcuts, which I despise personally. Uh, so I'm like hitting all the wrong keys trying to figure it out. And then there's a lag with Zoom. And yeah, because we had a little bit of a hiccup with uh, mixing some footage up in terms of like what order it should be in because they wanted it in from start to finish. And uh, since you shot on two different cameras with separate file names and everything, it got a little messed up, but we figured it out. Yeah. So I, I, I got in here at, at 645, maybe 643. I want to know exactly what time I got in here, Stephen. Over three hours ago. I got in here at like 
three or something this morning to start editing. And I, and I did, and I, I would do like 20, 30 minutes. Then I'd stop for a couple minutes and I'd go back in and, and, and keep calling down. And the other thing too, is when you're actually shooting all that footage, for example, like the slow motion footage, you're just seeing it play back and you know, you're, you're capturing it in real time. Uh, you don't really know what the playback is going to look like. So you might've thought that you might've missed that particular shot or whatever it may be. Cause it happened so fast, but then you realize after the fact, Oh, I actually captured it. Uh, I'm curious, like, were there a lot of shots that you're like, I didn't think I got that, but I actually did. Also, with looking at the footage, and I put the standard like Canon conversion LUT to 709, uh, what you were looking at when you were actually shooting is like the gamma assist display where it kind of overlays a standard Rec. 709 LUT, but it always looks like shit on Canon cameras, at least. I'm curious, does it look a lot better to you now that you're seeing it, kind of what it's going to look like as the final product? Yeah, one, I didn't miss anything because I'm that good, so <laughs> I was right on it. And two, yeah, it looks much, it looks better here on the computer with whatever you put on it than in the camera. And and when it's playing back in the camera, it's straight up log. And so I'm shooting for what I think is the right exposure, and I also go in into the mindset where if we're in a dark situation, it's okay for it to be dark and not overdo it, not push the ISO just to make it look like it's daylight or bright because it's meant to be in the dark. And so, or in a lower light situation. So I, I think my stuff is fine. Uh, I, I think obviously anything on the set on the actual TV set where they're bowling looks great because their lights are super bright. And I was at one, what one two fiftieth of a second at two eight at uh, 800 ISO, which is the base ISO, base ISO, and everything was fine, right? And the the other issue with shooting log too is you typically expose to the right because you want to expose for more the shadows than the highlights because that's what gets noisy in post uh, are the shadows versus the highlights. I just expose for what I think is the right damn exposure. I can't think about the rest. I think you were like half a stop off, nothing crazy, like definitely usable footage for sure. Uh, that was what I was worried about was you shooting in log and having your exposure way off, but it was definitely close enough. Pretty good. No, I'm, I mean, you're the I'm, best of the best. So yes, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> I just, no, it's just when you have an understanding, I mean, I'm learning a lot of different things that I haven't had to use before. I can pick stuff up. Like if they need, they, they use different terminology for all the stuff sure. that when we're out doing these shoots. So you have to ask, I'm not afraid. I'm like, what does that mean? What is verite? Like what, what does this, these terms mean to you? Because they mean something different. What, what you think it means means something different to me or what you're trying to get at means something different. And and we just need to get on the same page. So, yeah, I mean, it just shows I am fully capable of shooting what I need to shoot, whether it comes to video or 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 photos. So that's always good. I did stop and take photos of the interview. So that's always good uh, just to have because still images are. Oh, I did. I, uh, yes, I got a bunch of good still images. I didn't really shoot a lot of them. I only did when I got bored of something else. Yeah. And so that's. That's that. The shooting the shooting went well. We're kind of wrapped on the budget that we had for the sizzle part of shooting, mm-hmm. and now it's moving to the editing phase. And when the ed- when the sizzle reel is done, the company will go have meetings with the Netflixes, the Apples, the Amazons of the world, HBOs, and see if someone wants it. And maybe multiple people want it, and they all try to pony up the most amount of money. And then we start making a big real deal show come March because we're looking to just go now. What is the ETA for the final turnaround for uh, the sizzle? The sizzle at the end of February. Oh, okay. Interesting. Like 15 days after we start, or I think they've budgeted 12 to 15 editing days. So how do you feel about being a video uh, editor now? Video editing is fucking (laughs) stupid. (laughs) I texted you back. I'm like, welcome to my world. (laughs) No, this is bullshit. Video editing is garbage. When he gave me 13 hours of Africa footage, I'm like, uh, I don't know what's what. I don't know. what cheetah shot you're talking about and all this stuff it's it's tough especially at least you shot the footage and you kind of really know what's what and you can kind of skip around and be like oh well i remember shooting that i don't need that clip that was a mess up me and dan really do have to watch like everything if you shot it yourself because we don't know what's what it sucks and that's what the editor would be doing if you gave him the footage he'd have to scrub through every single clip and kind of make a list of what's what yeah so let's move on to apple vision pro now i your uh, favorite new device Yeah, well, I was away and it came in on Friday and I didn't get home till Monday, so I couldn't play with it right away and we couldn't make a video right away. We filmed something Tuesday and we're trying to get it out for Saturday Yep, um, where it's kind of my thoughts on it. I mean, also Photo News Fix is going to have a lot of my thoughts on it, but the video that we filmed is a little longer at 20 minutes where I'm in the world editing in Lightroom, editing in mobile Lightroom, showing you how that all works and, and what I think about it. And... 
Um, should I go into what I think about it, Stephen? Yeah, I wouldn't give it all away so they can watch the video. But yeah, I would give your uh, your your quick thoughts, your overview. So few people listen to the podcast, it's not going to put a dent in it because they're going to want to see this it This is anyway. a visual based product anyway. You really need to watch the video to see what you see in the Apple Vision Pro. So I guess you can kind of give it and away. And I posted on Instagram that my first reaction when putting it on and the hello writes across the screen was, whoa, whoa. like I was like, whoa, it was it was a whoa moment because it just looks like it's in your space in front of you yeah. that this stuff is happening, that the screens or the movie that you're trying to watch is in your space or it's just floating or sitting out there and it just looks right or something is actually putting shadows and highlights onto the wall because it knows the wall is there in some of the things and it is pretty fascinating what it is capable of doing is it perfect the answer is of course it's not perfect but I think for a first generation product they hit it out of the park and got so many things right and with some software updates they'll get things even more right that don't work like I can't use face ID when I'm logged into the thing because my face is covered but my eyes are unlocking the device and my Apple ID is connected to both. So it should just know to pass through. Yeah. And that's just a software update that's going to have to happen across the board for apps. Uh, and, and it will happen. And speaking of apps, we realize that there also aren't certain native like basic Apple apps that aren't on there. Like pages we thought would be kind of, you know, working with that spatial world. But it's not on there. It's just a compatible iPad app that you can still download, but it's not a native app for the yeah, actual well, Apple Vision. You had, you had uh, Keynote is native, mm -hmm. and then I popped down Lightroom Mobile, but they still work the same. It still goes into that dock that you can't organize, but you still have the ability to open it, and you can use pages in there, and you can use... Uh, Lightroom Mobile, which is just called Lightroom Basically, Mobile. Basically, any app mobile. that you can download on your phone or iPad, uh, you can use in this device, but it might not be in, again, that like VR sphere world. It's not native, but it can pop open and work like any other app, even native apps. It yeah. works exactly the same mm -hmm. with the iOS apps as the native apps. So it's it's amazing being in there and what i found awesome is like i was in there and then my buddy called me on facetime and so he called me on facetime the bubble pops up you look at it you tap your fingers together which took me a minute to get used to because i kept tapping my middle finger not my forefinger and which makes and, more sense i'm surprised i didn't do that like it yeah, just feels it more does, natural it does feel more natural finger. yeah yep and so my buddy pops up in the thing. I'm watching his video. He's looking at me and my avatar. And, you know, it, it it worked. It was really cool. And I could move things out of the way and have a conversation. I could paste pictures into text messages. I could airdrop things to the computer. I could airdrop things to my phone. So it's well thought out. But Stephen, how did my avatar look when I when I called <laughs> people on FaceTime? So they call it what a FaceTime persona that you have to create and it kind of scans your face and makes yeah. it into the this uh, like 3D kind of avatar yours I don't know if you just scanned your face wrong but it looked terrible <laughs> but in an absolutely hilarious way me and Deb were just cracking up we could because you would call and your mouth wouldn't be like moving you would have no teeth and all of a sudden randomly your tongue would be like blah, 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 like stick out your eyes had no emotion they were just like regular eyes where when you scanned it right the second time all of that got fixed but I almost wish you didn't fix it because it was hilarious to watch you call. <laughs> yeah, they were laughing. To me, it looked like the GoldenEye game, you know, like the James Bond figure and stuff yeah, like that. The... It looked like that blocky head and there's no emotion. And yeah, I feel like that's what your persona looked like, where you look at MKBHD's video and his looked very lifelike. Yours was completely opposite <laughs> until you fixed it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, of course, you know, the battery life, you're, you're basically plugged in. You get two and a half to three hours of, of actual battery usage, depending on how you're using it. I could 100% see taking it on a plane at this point and using it if I can plug into the into the power adapter or I could use an external USB-C charger to charge the battery pack while I'm using it and get extra juice out of it. That would be one way to do it. And it's just a matter of getting a case that works Yeah, because Apple's case looks like the size of a helmet. It it's looks like huge. a small backpack. Yeah. It looks like a something you would take to the moon. It looks like a it, does. it looks like the thing that that the astronauts would have on their back. And it's also and it's just $200. It is. And so I need something that kind of looks like the Sony headphone case that 
is foam and it will be protective enough to put in my bag. I just need that. That's really all I need to drop it in there and call it a day. So we found I found this other one that's like one hundred and fifty nine dollars or one hundred and seventy nine if you want vegan leather, which yes. I don't need. But I got to wait a minute till I find the case that actually works because they're going to be coming and. It's just that that case is just way too big for 200 bucks because I do want to put it in my bag and not have it be an actual carry on. What's funny is that $159 case is, you know, nearly the same price and it's significantly smaller. Yet they're yeah. charging you almost the same because they know yeah. they can get away with it. If you're buying a $3,500 expensive product, you're going to easily drop $200 for a nice case like that. So one of the coolest things about using it is being able to connect to the computer and take over your display. You still can use your keyboard, you still can use your mouse, but I can sit there with a huge display and work on it, which means if you are someone who travels and works, or let's say you are you work uh, for the AP or Getty and you have to edit images in the press room and your computer is a 14 inch laptop and you want to edit on something bigger, you can go into the Vision Pro, connect to the computer and start editing that way and just have a huge monitor or whatever size monitor you want in front of you and get work done. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it just that part is super cool. And that makes me question whether should I get a 14 inch laptop for travel because it's lighter and smaller. And if I need to edit, which I could sit in my hotel room and just have a bigger screen in front of my face. And you're also not editing like me, like 10 hours at a time where it would be really draining. I think you're probably editing photos for what, two, three, four hours at a time. If that never, never two, three, four even, hours at right? a time. Yeah. That's a good option for you is what I'm saying. You're only putting on for an hour yeah, at a time. Like an hour. That. Yeah. But Max Yuriev just did a video where he said he put it on. He had it on for eight straight hours. Wow. And he said after a while, it just felt fine. Yeah. Right. And I felt you that, said that too. too. Yeah. I've been I wore it for over two hours when I was just trying it out. And the only thing that they really need to do is they, there needs to be a better nose cushion. Mm. There needs to be some rubber piece that just sits on your nose that takes off a little bit of the weight or a little bit of the strain. But other than that, if you use the double loop strap, not the stupid loop single loop you use the double strap it's just much more comfortable it's not greatly comfortable but after a while you sit there and you're like nah this is pretty good this isn't really that bad i've it, heard everyone say that you really need to use that double strap and not the single loop yeah and i think most people are on the same boat in the same boat as they're like you know what i didn't know what to expect but i didn't expect it to be what it is or how good it is right off of the rip right and so it's only going to continue to get better. Is it worth buying for most people? The answer is no. It's too expensive. Second generation, if it gets to like two grand or less, you know, if this thing was two grand or less, it'd probably sell a lot more of them. But even two grand is a lot of money to spend on something this like this. I mean, spending almost four thousand dollars for this first generation product is a is a joke. Yeah. Right. If I if I didn't have the YouTube channel and I didn't have the ability to make other content off of it and money off of it, I, I wouldn't do it. But I could see myself using it. And you said for once you actually saw that they were available in Apple stores, which usually never happens for a first gen product that just got released. A friend of mine said that he went and tried it out on the first day and there were they were available in the store, which means not a ton of people are buying, which was expected. You know, it's a, again, a nearly four thousand dollar product. Not everyone in the world is going to be buying one. Yeah, I, I think the future generations, they'll be able to get it smaller, lighter, make some make some better corrections. But you went into the world. I, I let you go in as a guest. Yeah, I, I mean, I only used it for maybe five minutes, but it is incredible. I, now, I don't think I had my eyes dialed in perfectly. Uh, again, I just tried it on really quick because it looked a little soft to me, but you said you didn't have that issue. So I think it was just either I need the readers, like you said. I am uh, nearsighted, so I can't really see far. I don't know if that's an issue with them, but uh, I typically don't need glasses when I'm just, you know, looking at my monitor every day. This is different. This is different. I mean, we let Deb go in there and Deb was like, I can't see that it's ever going to be sharp because she's used every other uh, VR headset that exists. And then she went in there. She's like, I will say, and she got a little motion sickness, but she did, I did say too, that. Yeah. And I, I didn't, I didn't get motion sickness. So I got a little motion sickness and I will say even editing the final video where I'm looking at the screen recording gave me motion sickness throughout the day. Like yesterday, uh, I think bitch. it just depends what type of person you are. You either get motion sickness or a you bitch. don't, you're either a bitch or you're not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, 
Uh, I will say I do agree that the text looks super sharp and rich, especially the native apps. Uh, Lightroom looked pretty awesome. It is really, it, it's Minority Report. It's really interesting using your fingers to control everything. And it mm -hmm. is super intuitive. Once you explained how to move things, it only took me a few minutes to kind of figure it out. And Lightroom was, I think the picture, the colors look great. The, co the, the tones and density look great. The only thing is you can't control how bright and dark the, it's auto brightness and auto darkness in the, in the vision pro. Based so on your ambient environment, I assume. I don't know what it's based off of because it just was, it would change from depending on where I looked and it would get brighter or darker. So that part was off, but I still think the colors and contrast look great. But let me, let me just say Deb went in there and she said that she admitted that the, it was the sharpest one she's ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, now, I said when I was looking at her away from my desk and she was like 30 feet away, I said in the future, because I wanted to pinch and zoom on her to zoom her in so I could see her because mm -hmm. I don't see very well. And that's probably this is like a seeing aid for me. So it helps exactly. me see the world better. But I can see in the future that you'll be able to pinch and zoom or highlight a subject, draw a box around them, and then it will bring it up with better high megapixels. And it's just going to look it's almost great. like digital binoculars or something like that like that basically yeah it's like the iphone you can just have multiple lenses and you can zoom in and see better far away and all kinds of stuff so i think that is a thing that will be helpful now for those with eye conditions like me that have a nystagmus i show in the video that's going to be coming out the the screen recording from inside of my eyes moving because you can turn on a, a, a dot to show where your eyes are looking and holy shit they just bounce back and forth so fast so fast that it makes it difficult at certain times for me to click the right thing. Speaking of the final video and, and being hard to click on certain things, there were a lot of times I had to cut around that video where you just couldn't focus on the one piece you had to click on to like, you know, resize the screen or move it farther or closer. Well, I'm staring at it. I'm looking at it, but, with but your it, my eyes, eyes are shaking. It's shaking and the cursor is shaking and it doesn't really know what you're looking at exactly. Now with me, it was fine. But again, I don't have an eye condition like you do. Right. And they even warn that if you do have a nystagmus or any other eye conditions, this might not be the best product for you. But it still works really well for you. I didn't think it, it would really work at all. And it does. Well, they weren't saying that it may not be for you. They're saying that they're, they built in accessibility options where you can use your wrist turning, you can use your head, you can use something else, like a point, like maybe I can point at it. So I have to go in there and really play with those settings to find it. It wasn't super intuitive to know which of those settings were the ones that I needed. Um, but it was cool because you could put in this button that's like a quick button that it shows up on the screen and you put your finger, you press the button in the viewfinder and it pulls up this menu that has a bunch of different options on it. And it's kind of really cool to just be able to have that stuff available because you can be like, boop, pop it up or look up, pull that thing, move stuff over, get it out of the way, turn and look here. It just, it becomes really second nature really quick. And when you do take it off, you wish you did have some of those options in the real world. <laughs> the issue we had with filming the actual video it's hard to visually showcase exactly what you're seeing inside the Apple Vision Pro for example we realized after the fact that the screen recording that you're doing well one it's super compressed uh, it's very much like an iPad screen recording only 1080p so lower resolution with a variable frame rate it's rough to look at after the fact it doesn't really look like what you saw in the apple vision pro the main thing is it does like a 16 by 9 crop so you're not really seeing the full spatial environment that you're seeing in the goggles in the final video which is kind of annoying but some of the other issues were it's shaky because you're talking throughout the video it might not look good to the viewer but in reality when you're viewing it it looks fine even when you are talking uh, and also you like things so big. <laughs> so when you had Lightroom open, you had it probably what, like equivalent to like a hundred inch TV or even more. It was big. I don't know. They don't tell you. It, it was so big where you literally were moving your head left to right to view both sides of Lightroom. So it's hard which, to see it in the final video, but which I would like an option to be able to curve the edges of the screen. Yeah. Because when you use curved screens that get super large, there's a reason it's curved because you don't, don't have you don't to do the look. full 180 yeah. degree look left to right. Yeah. And so I would like to be able to have the option to curve it slightly digitally, you know, just so that it knows it. And then that way you can just look a little to the left and a little to the right. And these are things that they probably will improve. And for some reason, the screen recording was a little off, like it was a little crooked, but it seemed like it did that for 
anyone that wore it. Did it did that for you too. Yeah. So it's not how you wore it. It's just the way it records the screen for some reason. When I was mirroring what, so you can put someone into the world and before you put them in as a guest, you can mirror to your computer screen so that you can direct them through, which is what I did for Steven. Mm-hmm. I was able to put the mirroring on and then I could point him and tell him what to do. Like, okay, you see that line at the bottom? Hit that. And so that is cool. They built in a lot of great features and it will continue to get better. And hopefully one day we'll be able to put on a pair of glasses that have all the power and have all the ability to like put a teleprompter to put everything right there. I think it will get there. It's going to take a lot of time. Maybe in 20 years, you might have contact lenses that have enough battery power and enough computing power that they can go ahead and put these things in there, but it will happen one day. It's just not today. Now, I did not look at any nude. I did not look at any nude pictures sure. yet inside of there, Stephen. I didn't zoom in on any <laughs> I saw of them. a lot of tissues on your desk. The, uh, there's zero tissues on did my you see, desk. <laughs> did you see the one thing I sent you? Yeah, I saw that one. <laughs> the guy who's using the Apple Vision Pro, he's like, I'm having a lot of fun using my Apple Vision Pro. And then he puts it on the desk and it's just covered with tissues yeah. and lotion. The thing is, I had trouble in Safari using the web browser. So I went to YouTube because there's no native YouTube app. And I had trouble clicking on the speed, right? Like I wanted to make it 2x speed, but I tried to do that, but then it would move the the the, the timeline. And so it, I just couldn't hit the right buttons in there. But again, I and think then, that's more your eye condition. I think it would probably yeah, be fine for someone like me. There needs to be a native app. I agree for that. Yeah, I'm and sure Netflix there will be. Netflix doesn't have a native app. The question is, will they get on it right away? Because, you know, there's only so many people using these devices. Is it, is it even worth the time no. to put out native apps? I don't know. But Disney Plus is in there, which I, I don't have an account for that anymore. So there's that. Is that and native? Apple TV. Yeah, there's native apps. There's native basketball apps. There's a couple of native apps that are built for it that are really, really cool. I still have yet to view a a movie or any of those experiences like the one, the basketball one, right? Well, the the, the dinosaur experience is fucking nuts. Anyway, let's move on from there. A couple things to talk about. Now, did you know who John Green was? No, you had said that you met him, and I'm like, I have no idea who that person is. So John Green is part of the Vlog Brothers. He's one brother of the Vlog Brothers. It's Hank and John Green. I still don't know who that is. 2007. Yeah. 2007, they were like early first-gen YouTubers. They got a big following. They had a million followers back in the day before a lot of other people. They also, uh, Hank Green started vidcon right that was his thing okay they did the react videos where you have a kid reacting to a cd player or a bunch of kids reacting like what is this how does this work or a cassette player right they didn't know that or adults reacting to music of today right they did all of that they produced all that but john green also wrote the fault in our stars and he wrote turtles all the way down which i've never heard of that book but i think the younger generation knows that in paper towns he sold over 30 plus million Oh, paper towns was a movie too yeah he sold that that was his he wrote that yeah and so this this is i i met him and hung out with him for a while because he's from indiana indianapolis where I was. So he's just a bowling fan or you met nope, him somewhere not else? not at all. Oh, okay. No, one of, the, one of the people in our production is friends with him because they're working on a show together and he invited him to the bowling center because they were going to go do lunch and John didn't want to come in and watch bowling, but he did come in and watch and was like, after a couple minutes, he's like, oh, this is actually good. Can we come back later and watch more? And so when he came back later, we watched more uh, and then I introduced him to Stu, which you'll see on the show when we get the show out. Stu is like the lovable character um, who hangs around and 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 every once in a while you know shoots up the scoreboard and then drops below the cut line when he shouldn't drop below sorry Stu sorry Stu it's it's facts like he was he was in like sixth the Way other day down. and then he ended up in 41st but Stu's a, a British guy so he, he likes football and he was John Green has a they're trying to do a show about I think Wimbledon soccer club or something and Stu likes a different soccer club so Stu was busting his balls and they were having a go at it but I think it was kind of fun I just I just enjoyed having conversations with John I thought he was awesome to talk with and then of course he asked me about um, cameras like what should he get what does he use? Does he still do uh, YouTube content? Yeah, they still do YouTube content. He So the PA that we had, who was 23 years old, looked right at John because he knew him instantly. And he was like, he was my Bill Nye because oh, he wow. also does science and history stuff on YouTube teaching. Mm. And so that's he's like, I learned all from your videos. So that was cool because the kid recognized and and knew exactly who he was. And he said he was my Bill Nye. So that definitely puts it into perspective 
what he was capable of doing or what he did do or does do. That that was cool. You want to you want to give a factory update because while I was away, you got to play in the factory. Yeah, so uh, it's finally all starting to come together. Actually, the Apple Vision Pro video will be the first video with your finalized desk set, which I've been trying to do since we moved in. We just put up a makeshift desk setup uh, just to get you going in the in the meantime. But now it is pretty much finalized. We got your shelf all done. We did a faux brick backdrop. And I think it looks great on camera. The biggest thing for your set, I wanted to make sure that there were meaningful items on your shelf to you. Like you have Kermit the Frog. We've got Bob Ross figurines. Uh, there was uh, Mr. Rogers figurine. There was your D3S that started your YouTube career for the most part. I tried to yeah. put all these meaningful items and make it colorful. Skittles. <laughs> make it very much your style because I think that desk setup should be more about you and your personality. Exactly. Not so much that it's only like camera related stuff. So that's one set we have finalized. The store set has been done. And then I finally finished the comparison set like two, three weeks ago. And we filmed a few videos on that, which will be coming out shortly. And I think that set looks pretty baller too. And we can do a lot of not just comparisons, but just talking head stuff there too. And then the next thing to do is fix, rip that apart, uh, not go too over the top, but just make it look more professional than uh, you know having moving boxes in the background like it is now. Then once that's done, we have the scripted set to finish. So two more sets to go and then we're pretty good we're finally like fully moved in ready to go cameras locked we can record like that so that's always been the plan there's many plans and i love it when a plan comes together <laughs> the first thing was just getting everything back up and running and in the meantime you know it's not like we were just transferring sets from the old place to the new place we were rebuilding them from scratch for the most part minus the store set that kind of stayed the same but everything else is it's completely different yeah and hopefully it just stays. And once it's all set, we can churn and burn exactly. even more. Exactly. That's the point. Yep. We've had trouble for the last bunch of like four or five, I mean, four months since like moving. It's more than four months now. But getting everything situated, there was Stephen had a baby. Then then there are the holidays and then the yep. new year. And I had said there's going to be some growing pains. There's a lot of transitioning going on right now at the factory, just from the old place to the new place. Like, it's just me trying to figure everything out. So... And in the meantime, we're trying to film all this content, edit it all, but then also try and get the factory back up and running. So it's a lot and of stuff. And I'm traveling all over. And you're traveling, stuff. yeah. Yep. But you don't need me. We can film like one day or two days in a week and we'll have plenty for the next couple of weeks. Exactly. As long as you give me a heads up, I just need a day or two and then we can film enough for me and Dan to kind of be busy for one to two weeks. Uh, so the story I want to move into next is the uh, the blur trend. This is from Petapixel. Yes. They posted the blur trend in wedding photography isn't going anywhere. Here's how to nail it. Yes. I, I'm, I want to read some of this to you because while it arrived on the wedding scene within the last couple of years, the trend of intentionally blurring photos is still going strong and it's unlikely to be leaving anytime soon. It's a specific technique that on first glance could look like a mistake to be relegated to the outtakes pile, but when done well, it can capture the essence of movement in a still shot, offer focus in a crowded space, and bring a unique beauty to wedding photos. And there lies the fucking issue with this. They are miscategorizing one thing as something else. It's not a blurry photo if you utilize motion blur. Yes. It's not a blurry photo if you use a slow shutter speed and drag the flash. You you, you pop a flash and you drag the shutter because one of it is they're going to be frozen in time, but there's going to be motion around them. That is not blurry photography trend. These TikTok fucks who think they're photographers who say one out of 250 when they are telling you shutter speeds <laughs> have no fucking clue what they're talking about. They are intentionally blurring images. Like the entire moving the image. focus <laughs> right be like isn't it wonderful it's totally out of focus Art. or where they where they focus on the photo frame and the person is out of focus on the beach in the background it's fucking stupid <laughs> it's just fucking stupid I, I remember my brother his wedding photographer this is going back like 12 years he got my brother twirling his wife around and she was blurred out with motion blur because of the twirl and he was frozen in time and I thought that image was really artistically done well with motion blur but yeah like you're saying any random photo that's just completely blurred out for no reason not really showcasing motion in the photo just makes no sense yeah and then and, then, and i think that's the issue i think people are misconstruing this idea of what a blurry photo is because a blurry photo to me is it's out of focus if Correct. you utilize motion in an image it's a different story yeah 
if someone is smoking and you go with a slow shutter speed and you get the hand moving, or if you're shooting a guitarist drummer. and there's some motion blur, a drummer with motion blur, but they're frozen, but the sticks are moving, that is using your skill to get an image that conveys motion. But if you're just blurring something just to blur it, you're an asshole. And if you look in the mirror and you do that, just call yourself an asshole right now. I am an asshole. Say it with me, Stephen. I am an... Stephen, say it with me, God damn it. No, I I'm good. I am an asshole. No, but they, 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 they have a quote here from a wedding photographer. It's not just a technique. It's a creative tool that can elevate the storytelling aspect of your wedding album in breathtaking ways. I haven't read this article, but the photos on here, are these actual examples of this trend? Because I think these are all terrible photos. Uh, that is correct. This one of this girl that looks like a who. Uh, <laughs> she, does. <laughs> she does. She does look like a who. <laughs> she. I'm just uh. describing it so you guys can understand the characters. She's like a who, and this guy is like the tallest guy ever, and he's grabbing onto her hands, and he's not wearing an Apple Watch. He's wearing a round watch. He's completely out of... He's like out of focus. This is not done well for a motion blurred image. This is just a straight up fucking out of focus. See, there's a, there's a happy medium. When you're trying to do slow shutter speed exactly if you do like 1 60th of a second yep. for blur it doesn't it's look not good enough. it looks like it looks like you messed up the image exactly if you go to a tenth of a second and you pan with it because it's close enough where it's almost could be sharp if you were a little higher shutter speed but the fact that it's still kind of in focus with just some slight slight motion blur makes it look like it's just a mistake not an actual uh, intended use of slow shutter speed yeah, so it goes on to say other things like motion blur adds a sense of energy, emotion, and dynamism to your wedding shots. It's be it beautifully captures emotion and rhythm of the moment, whether it's the twirl of a bridal gown, the dance floor in full swing, or the laughter-filled candid moment. Right, of course. That makes total sense if you do it right, but everybody is misconstruing it and just taking out-of-focus pictures. Like, I get the slow shutter, rear curtain sync, flash photos, you know, to try and convey there's a party, it's the reception, that kind of stuff. But I just feel like after a few of those, it just gets overdone. You know, why would you shoot the entire reception that kind of yeah. way? Oh, my God, Stephen. I got down to the other Mary, Mary Lou Who or whatever Mary Lou Who is. It's the black and white. That's just not that's not motion blur. That's out of focus. Yeah. Like you said, it's like they're one one hundredth of a second moving slightly just enough where there's some blur going on. But it just looks like it's a missed shot. Yeah. No, this is like that's not motion blur. That's just blur. Should be at like one fifth of a second, super blurred if they really want to convey that motion of twirling around. But, but, but brides love it. Brides specifically come to me and say, oh, I love your out of focus stuff. Really? Why don't you hire a blind person to shoot your wedding, you <laughs> dumbass? <laughs> Uh, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just the things get misconstrued. You, you're like, if I had a wedding photographer, a, a bride come to me, if I was shooting weddings and be like, you know, I love this trend. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, you're talking to me. I don't do trends. I do timeless beautifulness, timeless beautifulness, stuff that is, you know, capturing your moment and capturing the emotion. And if I do so happen to slow the shutter speed down, you'll get some of that what you think is a trend, but I think is artistic and works because it's not just out of focus. I got you nice and sharp, but then the sh then the flash popped and I get a little, you know, sorry, I go nice and slow, then the flash popped, freezes your beautiful face as your gown was twirling. Like that is creative and artistic and you're still sharp in some ways. But just come down the aisle and having you completely out of focus doesn't count and doesn't work so the couple might have a different vision for their images they might be planning to hang a very sharp focus artwork on their wall blurred images won't be the best option for that she adds photographers should also avoid using blur during significant moments in family group shots no no i think you should blur the uh, 50 family group shot of 50 people <laughs> i think you should be like no this is a trend exactly what you're saying like it, it is a trend it is a fad that will look terrible 10 years from now just like some of the over the top editing these days will look terrible in 10 years from now it will not look timeless you want to shoot for those timeless photos when it comes to weddings especially when you hear the word trend you should go running because you should have your style 
That should be your way of doing things. It's not saying you can't also try something different, but anything that's a trend, like printing on metallic paper for a while, right? Everything comes to an end. And yes, everything cycles or doing sepia tone or doing uh, split tone in color. HDR photos was a huge Ugh. trend like 10 years ago. I remember I went through that. And now I look back and I'm like, these look terrible. <laughs> Does that still exist, by the way? Stuck, stuck in customs? Trey Radcliffe? Not tr what was the software we would use that when Lightroom didn't actually support HDR photography? What the hell was that called? Uh, photo. Uh, original HDR photo software. Photomatics. It was called Photomatics. I used to use that back in the day. I'm talking 13 years ago when Trey Radcliffe was the biggest thing back then, stuck in customs, all his HDR photography. Uh, and I went way over the top with the HDR photos. I would bracket like seven photos, mix them all up. They had different levels of HDR that you could do. And I would always choose like the grunge one that was way over processed. You know, meanwhile, I'm like 18 years old thinking it was the coolest looking thing ever. And now I look yeah. back and I'm like, yep, hiding that photo from my feed, hiding that one. <laughs> yeah. But that's what Gen Z is going through right now. It's, it's a fad that looks cool. It's something different. And they're going to look back in 12, 13 years like I did and be like, whoa, this looks absolutely terrible. Yeah. I uh, Looking back at um, <laughs> looking back at Trey Radcliffe's site, I don't think he's still doing stuck in customs anymore. I wouldn't be he surprised. Was his, maybe. I mean, he was big on on Google. Google. Oh, Wave, yeah. Google circles. Google what was Plus. it called? Google Plus. Google Plus. Yeah, he had like 20 million people in his circles. He was yeah. one of the recommended people. Man, they were pushing Google Plus hard. And, you know, we didn't choose to go. We didn't choose to go deep into that because that we knew was garbage. This comment. So Gen Z creativity is to create garbage photos that have massive technical flaws and call them artistic and trendy. Gotcha. These people need to be sent to photography school. Well, so the, the other thing is, if you tell someone now, I'm not going to go on to someone's Instagram page and tell them that they suck because that doesn't serve a purpose. But I would like to. I'm thinking it like. But what this person just said is that, you know, what, what saying that. Gen Z or whoever, millennials, xenials, whatever, is doing these types of images and think it's great. And the problem is if you try to tell someone and educate them on why it's not good, all of a sudden you're not woke enough and they'll be like, no, I like it. It's just like having someone who's overweight and then saying something and then they're like, oh, no, no. If your photo sucks, your photo sucks. <laughs> I agree. Steven's not touching that one with a 10 foot pole. Nope. But it's, but it, but it is true. It's like trends come and go. There's a reason they come and go because they get overdone or they just suck. But if you take quality images and you're creative and you try a little bit of this and a little bit of that, that fits your style, you're not chasing it. Don't chase trends. It's just like chasing waterfalls or going on YouTube and trying to be the, uh, Mr. Beastifying your your thumbnails to match what he does instead of just being you. There's a reason you should be you. At the end of the day, you learn the rules so then you know when you can break them when it comes to certain types of photography. And you do it just enough where it's not a completely blurred photo, but you use it artistically because you know the general rules of photography. And you're not just yeah. aimlessly taking blurry photos to take blurry photos. Yep. Yep. You just, you just, oh, whatever. <laughs> The moral of the story here is don't be a zenial. <laughs> if you're a zenial, don't be. Uh, no, the, the, the moral of the story is just take quality images and don't chase trends and you should be fine. And at and, the end of the day, you know, art is subjective. I do get it. But like, no, in general, I think everyone pretty much agrees that blurry photos with no purpose look like shit. That's what you would think, Stephen. And then you talk to a 20 something who's who who's the bride is like, oh, I just love your out of focus stuff. It's <laughs> it's so amazing. Oh, I want you to take out of focus photos of me. I, I get film. I get taking Polaroid pictures. I get that like vintage, you know, that kind of look. I do get that. But the blur look, I just don't understand. For once, this is like a trend that I'm like, that just doesn't make sense. Do you know someone that, you know what we want to know before we go what someone asked me yesterday because their their girlfriend is pregnant? Uh, take maternity photos? Yeah, I said no before. As soon as he said my girlfriend's <laughs> pregnant and I was like, no. <laughs> I was just like, no. He's like, well, 
I'm like, no, I don't do maternity photos. One, I don't have the patience to do them. I don't like them. I don't think they look good. You need to find someone who does that. Exactly. And that's their, and that's their because thing. It's all about the posing when it comes to maternity photos. It can look absolutely terrible. Like you took a picture of uh, someone in the bathing suit in the woods. In, in, in the forest. Yeah. <laughs> or inside jokes. <laughs> what I was saying to the guy is, you know, I was thinking, why don't I make it blurry And so that 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 is reminiscent of the baby in the womb in the omniatic fluid sack, whatever it's called. Uh And so they don't see clearly because of all the fluid. And so we want to see what they would see. So we're going to take a picture of your girlfriend uh, blurry. I I do understand the reasoning behind wanting to get like especially the woman wanting to get a maternity photo of herself because she may never see that part of her body again she may never look like that ever again and she wants to capture that in a timeless manner no i i I can get it that that it's a huge moment for someone's life to be growing another human being in there and that they want to memorialize it with these photos so that when they look back and they can be like you were in there and that was great but i'm still a big fan of if you're going to do those type of images you should probably do conception photography as well which i am offering as a new service today (laughs) for the low low price of 69.99 if you call me and you say, Jared, I would like you to be there for the conception, I might be able to get those cameras rolling and use good slow shutter speed to get the in and out motion to convey <laughs> the motion that's going on. Oh and my God. I also offer macro photography of the actual <laughs> moment that the sperm enters the canal of love. <laughs> and that's all we have that today for, for Raw Talk. Uh, uh. Is this Raw Talk? This, yeah, is this is Raw Talk. Talk. Yes, it's not Talk. Photo News Fix. <laughs> Raw Talk 88, Stephen. 88. 88. We're getting 88. there. Eric Lindros. Wow, we've had 100 podcasts before. We've had three. We've probably done over 400 plus. Oh, yeah, we've done definitely done that since day one. the original Raw Talk podcast. stopped at like 247 or something, if I recall. Something along those lines. <laughs> there were a lot of those. 247. <laughs> All right. I got to get back to doing lunch and then get back to editing. Yes, I can't wait to hear you bitching about editing again. <laughs> no, I didn't bitch once I started the second time. I think I got that fucking tension out of my body. Yeah. Just, you know, I was really upset. The crazy part, though, is is think about now if you had to actually do something with that footage. You're just simply culling it down. Now think about yeah. if you actually had to make make a story out of it from nothing. No, that's I'm not an part. editor, Stephen. I, this is what just I saying, would do. That's what I, we go through. It's, it's tough. <laughs> Especially <laughs> when there's no direction. It's like, oh, just figure it out. <laughs> exactly. That's why you're an editor and I pay editors to do their job. It's not easy. Right. I never said it was easy. You make it seem get like it, it, when done. You want, it turned around in the day. Yeah, get it done. Yeah. Figure it out. I used to just post a video after I shot it, Stephen. Looks great. <clears throat> I just go live onto the internet. <laughs> uh, All right. Let's get back to work. All right. All right, guys. Thank thank you for, for listening, as always. If you got this far, thank you. You could text us at that text number, which is 313-710-9729. Some people text us. Maybe I should delete that text line. I don't know. Cost me. A- I try to interact every day if I can. Yeah, I wasn't able to do birthday wishes every day because I was really busy. When I'm out in the world shooting, I'm not posting on Instagram. I'm not using my phone like I would be using my phone if I'm at home because people are like, oh, you're always addicted. I'm like, when I'm busy, I don't touch it. That is very true. Same with my penis. When I'm busy, I don't touch it. <laughs> okay. But when I'm not busy, woo, look out. Look out. I go uh, in my You are Apple, literally a wanker. <laughs> Apple Vision Pro. All right. All right. Let's get out of here, Stephen. I got to have some lunch. Uh, okay. I was up early. I got up early to get in here. I heard. All right. Bye, Stephen. <laughs> Bye. Jared, pull in front of photo.com. See ya. Hey, Dan. It's Jared. I, uh... I, I won't be there Sunday, so I need you to fuck one more time. Steven, I don't know how to cancel this. <laughs>